Hey guys, Ryan here with Man of Defense. Oh, excuse me. Hey guys, Ryan here with Man of Defense. Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some uh, handgun shooting tips and just some basics to help, uh, you know, ease your mind in terms of firearm safety and in terms of firearms handling and what makes us a better shooter. Um, currently, obviously, in the state of uh, state of affairs, I guess you could say, um, a lot of a lot of the country is in a state of emergency. A lot of people are being told right now they have to use shelter in place, or they are under some sort of stay-at-home law. Um, currently, Maryland, where I'm at, uh, we're under a stay-at-home order where, unless you're deemed essential, uh, you're told to stay at home. You're supposed to be social distancing, right? It's this whole new trend, which is, I believe, helping, um, but. It's very sad to see some of the smaller businesses that are dying off because they cannot keep up under this economy the way it is. Um, because I'm in the firearms industry, I've still been going to work. And um, something I wanted to talk to you guys about was, obviously there's been an uptick in firearm sales. People are buying guns. They have no idea what the hell they're buying. Um, you know, the biggest thing is people are driven by fear, right? And so what I'm here to do today is I'm sure, you know, as you guys have also noticed, uh, I haven't been super active on this account, but I've been trying to get more content out there for you. Uh, something that was important to me was I wanted to talk about some firearm basics just to help uh, put people's minds at ease in terms of like, this is how the gun works. These are things that we could be doing to help make ourselves better shooters and make ourselves safer, um, a little bit more accurate and uh, more confident. All right, so let's get to it. <laughs> Hi guys, so let's jump into it. I've been instructing officially for about four years. Uh, I had really been into firearms prior to that. I had been taking classes prior to that, uh, but it wasn't until, I guess, four years ago that I started officially instructing. Um, I have been started by the state, so under Maryland, I am a Maryland qualified handgun instructor. That means I'm able to certify people for wear and carries or the handgun qualification license. Um, I also have certifications from NRA, uh, 4-H, and a couple other organizations. Uh, the reason I did the 4-H, I wanted to be able to give back to the youth. Uh, I think it's very important that we do that. I grew up doing Boy Scouts. Um, I am an Eagle Scout, so you can call me a nerd later if you'd like. Uh, but I always wanted to be able to give back to the youth because I think it's so important that they understand firearm safety um, in a safe and healthy way. So uh, for me, <coughs> I would say I probably got into handguns after I got into rifles. Uh, being in Maryland, you know, uh, 18 years old, you can buy your rifle, 21 you can buy a handgun, uh, lower receiver, whatever it may be. But I used to shoot a lot more rifle and be more interested in that side of training, uh, but most of my students were more interested in handgun, so I typically ended up doing a lot more handgun lessons than not. I've taught 10 year olds all the way up to 80 year olds, uh, or 90 year olds I guess you could say, and people have come from every different walk of life. Uh, my big accomplishment for me was when I finally hit 200 individual one-on-ones um, not sessions, but 200 different students that I'd done one-on-ones with outside of my regular classroom teachings. And that was kind of a proud moment for me. Um, and so for me, what I wanted to do was, I wanted to be able to give something back. And I know right now everyone's stuck at home. And so because of that, uh, let's go ahead and just talk about some basic firearm safety and maybe understand some of the mechanics of how the gun is working and how we work with the gun. One of the first things I teach for a new shooter is some basic safety stuff. So the first one is, one, we always keep the firearm pointing in a safe direction. Two, we always keep our finger off the trigger until we're ready to shoot or have decided to engage. Three, this one is up for debate. They say that you should keep your gun unloaded until it's ready to be used. Well, if it's a hunting shotgun that's sitting in the safe, yes, it should be unloaded. If it's a gun for home defense, well, it should probably be loaded, right? Um, and also accessible uh, to an extent while still being uh, inaccessible to unauthorized persons. Uh, so typically I remove the third one and I replace that with always being aware of our target's foreground and our uh, target's background, right? So uh, at the end of the day, every shot that you take with a handgun, with a shotgun, with a rifle, whatever it may be, you are accountable for. So that's why it's so important to understand what is our foreground and our background with our target. Uh, the overall underlying rule, though, obviously, is just treat all firearms as if they're loaded. It doesn't matter if it's a toy gun or if it's a real gun, if it's unloaded. Um, we want to treat it as if it's a loaded firearm. So always be cautious with it. Um, but also be in control of your gun. That's, that's the big thing that it comes down to is we need to learn to dominate the firearm because we are in control, right? The gun doesn't control us, we drive the gun, okay? All right, guys, so let's talk about a safe direction real quick. Uh, this is something that people sometimes lack uh, understanding with, and it's a very simple concept. I'm not trying to make this video too long. Uh, but like, let's say I live in an apartment, I'm on the top floor. If I point my gun up, that is, yes, a safe direction. If I point it down, that's probably not a safe direction if I'm in an apartment and there are people below me. 
Well, no one's below me. Well, you don't know that, right? You can't see through the floor magically, can you? Uh, let's say I'm in a house and I'm in a basement, right? Uh, down is probably a safe direction at that point. Now, would up be a safe direction? Probably not, right? So we always have to be aware of what the safe direction is. It's always an ever-changing situational thing, whether it's you know a one store or one uh, one floor or one story uh, building, right? We might be like, oh, I can point it at this wall over here. Well, what's beyond that wall? You don't know, right? So we have to really be aware of our environment and how it's always ever changing, okay? Um, the other one is uh, keeping our finger off the trigger until we're ready to shoot. Some guys like to hold guns like this, okay? And the problem with this is you're not in control of the firearm, okay? If my hand is down here like this, I'm not really dominating the gun. I don't have good control. I also don't want to hold it like this. I don't want to hold it like this. You know, I don't want to hold it like this. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can hold the gun wrong. Uh, something that's important is to think that every time that we pick up the firearm, we're getting a good rep in, right? You, talk, you hear these guys talk about how, you know, it takes all these reps to fix the mistakes and everything. Well, let's just remember, we're trying to get good reps in the first time that we hold the gun, and every time we pick up the firearm, we're trying to get a good rep in, okay? I can't tell you how many times that when I pick up my gun, I clear it, and then I immediately do a couple dry fires just to get a couple reps in. So, uh, when we're keeping our finger off the trigger, we're going to get uh, a nice high tang grip. We'll talk about the grip in a second. But the big thing is, notice how my finger's here. If we can, let's try to go ahead and touch the seam of the firearm between the slide, which is the top piece that reciprocates, and the frame, which is on the bottom. Let's go ahead and try to get our finger right there, if not a little higher, right? That way we can really establish dominance with the gun. Uh, this is a two, uh, two-fold purpose here, okay? One, we're establishing an index on the firearm. Every time I pick up this gun, I should feel this under my finger, okay? Because of me doing that, I know that my finger's off the trigger. Two, what do we do very naturally with our finger, right? We point. We're pretty accurate when we point at things. Like I could say, hey, look at that deer over there. There's no deer over there right now. But as an example, we point. So because of that, when my finger is nice and high like this, and it's in line with the gun, I know where I'm pointing the gun without even looking at it, okay? So that's very important. And then, um, obviously, we talked about, you know, target and beyond. All right, so let's jump into something else real quick. When we pick up the gun for the first time, whether you find a gun or it's your gun or whatever it might be, there's a couple things we should do first to verify that the gun is clear and safe before we continue handling it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get a dominant grip on the gun. Let's go ahead and look at this. We have a tang, back strap, front strap. Okay? Tang, back strap, front strap. Tang just like the drink. Get a high tang grip in the web of your hand. Your finger's nice and high off the trigger. And so we need to go ahead and open the action. Now what happens here though is a lot of people struggle and they go like this. They try to do this pinching motion like this or they go like this and they do one of these numbers where they point at themselves, which is very unsafe. So what we need to do is we want to grab down on these serrations here in the back. We want to make sure our hand is clear of the actual chamber itself, like the barrel hood right here, okay? And I'm going to push and pull at the same time. So sometimes you'll pick up a gun and you're like, man, this spring is really stiff. It's really not that hard if you're using your body's mechanics to your advantage. So I'm going to push and pull at the same time. We're going to rack the slide three times, okay? One, two, three, okay? We do it in threes because we're increasing the likelihood that we would have ejected something that could have been in there. Well, now, we can't just assume that it's unloaded, and some guys like to do one of these numbers. Oh, yeah, it's safe, and they assume that it's clear. We really should do a full three-point check. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift up on my slide stop, which is here on the side of the gun. Okay? I'm going to lift up on the slide stop with my dominant thumb. I'm going to pull back on the slide with my weak hand, and then as soon as I pull all the way to the rear, I'm going to release my weak hand, and then I can release my dominant thumb. At this point, the slide is locked open. The other variation to that is you can pull the slide back and then lift up with your dominant thumb, okay? Whatever works for you is best. At this point, we do a quick three-point check where we inspect the chamber, the breech face, and the magazine well, okay? Some guys don't like to put their finger in there. I prefer to. So you will definitely notice a distinct difference of it being hollow, right? And then something being in there that shouldn't be, okay? So that's why it's important to actually get your finger in there, especially if you're in low light. So one, two, three, okay? One, two, three. Now, if you're asking that, all right, they're going to tell you, do this and then look away, do this and then look away. Yeah, you don't have to. If you want to, you can. But really, just make sure you're checking all three points at least twice, OK? So now that we've verified the firearm is empty, I'm going to go ahead and close the action. I'm going to go ahead and decock my gun, OK? Um, this is actually the first handgun I ever bought. This is a 226 Mark 25. Uh, I bought this uh, back in the day. And now this, this beautiful little thing has about 20,000 rounds through it. Uh, mind you, I do have two barrels, though. Uh, and I've gone through two recoil rod springs. Other than that, this gun's been a champ. So when we talk about our fundamentals, uh, we have a way to break them down. We can either do it in a pattern of three, we can do it in a pattern of about seven to eight, or we can break it all the way down to like 22 categories. I normally teach the seven to eight because I feel like that's the best one. 
And so when I do it that way, it's normally done within an hour. And that's a lot of information to compress into an hour. It's a lot to process in the mind, but it's a lot of good uh, concept for you to like absorb. So let's say you're picking up a gun you've never shot before and you forget everything. You're like, oh man, I just forgot this gun is so sweet or you know, whatever it might be. And so there are the three S's, okay? Slack, sights, squeeze, okay? Let's chop off that third S though and change it to a P. So it's SSP, slack, sights, press, okay? So if I forgot how to use a gun, I could pick it up, I would go ahead and get the slack out of the trigger, I would confirm my sights. Mind you, you're already looking at the sights to make sure they're on target, but give the slack, check your sights, press, okay? Slack, sights, press. That'll get you through any gun if you're unsure of it, especially if you're trying out a new gun and you're trying to kind of figure out, man, is this something I wanna buy? Um, things like that. When we actually go into the fundamentals though, we have stance, grip, sight picture, sight alignment, breathing, trigger press, follow through and reset. That's typically the way I teach it in that pattern, in that order. Um, but today we're actually just gonna talk about cycle of operations on the handgun, as well as a little bit about our grip and understanding focal planes and sights, okay? So, <coughs> the firearm has a thing called a cycle of operations, okay? So, I'm gonna take this magazine with a snap cap, I'm gonna load the magazine, okay? I'm gonna insert the magazine into the firearm. Great, it's seated, right? You don't have to slam it in there, we're just gonna seat it. The gun's gonna go through these operations, which are cocking, feeding, chambering, locking, firing, unlocking, extracting, ejecting, and cocking. Okay, that's a lot, I know. So, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cock it, okay? So that means we're going to pull this back, right? Which cocks the hammer, and we're gonna release the slide. That just fed the round into the chamber, okay? So that chambered the round. We then have to let the slide seal all the way. So if it was like a Glock or something, and you were just doing an admin load, you would give it a quick tap on the back. You can do that on a hammer fire too, but you know, you don't really want to. Um, so, it's locked. At this point, we would go through our process of firing, right? Bang, the gun goes off. At this point, the slide is gonna come to the rear, which is unlocking, okay? And it's extracting, because you have on the side of the gun, you have an extractor that grabs the back of the casing to pull it out of the chamber, and it's ejecting it. The ejector is actually the little pin in the back that you see that everyone's like, oh, that thing is bent. Is that the right angle? That's your ejector, okay? And while it's doing all this process, it's recocking the gun and reloading it. That's the purpose of the semi-automatic, right? So, it just depends on what kind of gun it is, but that's typically your order of operation. Anyways, let's talk about the uh, grip here, okay? So when we're talking about our grip that we're trying to establish, we have tang, back strap, front strap, okay? High tang grip again, right? Finger off the trigger. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna lift up my dominant thumb, okay? Now right now I'm gonna crush this gun. I want you to see what's happening, okay? You can see I'm starting to white knuckle a little bit. I don't think you can see it from there. I'm starting to white knuckle a little bit, and if I already continue doing this, I'm going to fatigue faster, right? I'm pushing blood out of my hand, it's going back into my body. My lungs are working harder, my heart's beating faster, it's trying to get more blood back out to my hand. So we start to see the shake sometimes, right? Well, some instructors are gonna teach you a push-pull method, some guys are gonna teach you like a 30-70 or 40-60, whatever the hell they're teaching you, it's fine. There are just different ways to get to the end result. The way that I've always been teaching people, that I've found from all the instruction that I've received, is that we should be doing 100% pressure with both hands. There's no point in you trying to gauge, okay, is this hand doing more, is this hand doing less? It's the same, okay? So I'm going to take this hand, I'm pulling the gun into my hand, okay? I'm trying to create a vice around this gun, right? Let, let's talk concept real quick. If the vice was here holding the gun and I were to fire, nothing should happen theoretically, right? Especially if we're here, okay? Now, if the pressure for the vice was on the side, right, and you fire, what's gonna happen? The gun's gonna rotate back, right? And so, uh, another concept I like to use for people, and you can use this tip for your friends, is make them write with a pen, okay? When you hold the pen at the bottom, you're closer to the tip of the axis. Because of that, we have speed and control. We can write our names very nicely. Make them try to write holding at the very top of the pen, right? So we're further from the axis, and it looks like shit, right? And that's because either A, we're choosing speed, or B, we're choosing accuracy. Well, it's the same thing with the gun. If I'm further away from the axis, I have to choose, do I wanna be fast, or do I wanna be accurate? If I'm closer up to that axis, which is my barrel, right? I can choose to have both, okay? So, I'm nice and high. What I'm taking though is I'm applying pressure right here on my middle finger and then my ring finger. Finger pressures will change absolutely what happens with the gun when you're shooting it, okay? Because a lot of people think, as long as I got a good grip now, I'm good to go. Same concept as when we hold a small gun. We're like, oh man, this feels great. A lot of people forget the concept of, okay, let me take this nine millimeter, let's put it in a gun that's a third of the size of this thing and let's see how well you actually shoot, right? Uh, what it comes down to is you're taking uh, an explosion, a controlled explosion 
and it's coming out of something a third of the size of this. It's going to be a lot harder to control during the actual firing process. Uh, holding it, yeah, it's a breeze, okay? So, I'm pulling the gun into my hand, okay? So my fingers are applying pressure back, but I'm actually applying pressure on the front, okay? I'm not applying pressure on the sides necessarily, or I'm not at least focusing on squeezing or crushing the gun. Uh, when we talk about that rope reflex that humans have, it's like this concentric pressure, right? So like if I were to pick uh, a barbell, right, or a dumbbell up, my hands are going to wrap around. Our fingers all want to work together. The thing is we're trying to make it where our trigger finger is separated from the rest of our hand. We're trying to isolate that guy to operate separately, right? We want our trigger press to be flat, okay, not curved, okay? This can come from practice. Quick tip on this, just drag your finger on the counter. Right now, maybe not because there's a virus thing going around, so maybe not touching as much stuff, but just practice going flat, okay? You're relaxing the inner muscle, uh, sorry, the outer muscle and contracting. Is that right? No, either way, you're just relaxing one of the muscles and you're contracting the other one, okay? So that's how you get it flat. Mind you, don't worry, your finger's not gonna be messed up, you can still curl it, okay? So, take the gun, we've got our dominant grip, pulling the gun into our hand. We're gonna lift our dominant thumb up. We're gonna take our weak hand, and a lot of people just mash it on there, right? They just mash the hand on the gun. Problem is, they're not getting their hand in the right position. So normally you'll see this big gap back here. Okay, right here, you'll see people hold the gun like this. You'll see people uh, do the classic cup and saucer, all these kinds of things. Um, if it's comfortable for you, fine. Is it the most effective? Probably not. So, what we wanna do with our weak hand though is we wanna splay it and flag it open. We're gonna rotate so we're pointing that thumb at the target, right? So like right now, if you were to point your thumb at the target on the wall, I could point there, I could snap my eyes over here, snap my weak thumb to it, and guess what? It's pointing right at it. Again, using the human body to our advantage. So I'm gonna take this hand, I'm gonna rotate it. I'm gonna place this thumb so it's paring forward on the frame, not on the slide, on the frame, okay? I'm then gonna set these fingers underneath the trigger guard. I personally like to place these fingers first and then stretch my hand into place. So that way I'm really creating a vice on the gun. Um, originally I used to come in on this side and stretch these fingers under, but I found that I was losing my grip, right? And something that I've always taught my students was that if you find that your weak hand is coming off while you're shooting, that means you didn't have a good grip the first time, okay? So, let's get our dominant hand on. We're gonna place our weak hand in here on the gun. This dominant thumb is then coming down, okay? So, great. We're wrapping around the gun. We're applying pressure front to rear. We're pulling the gun into our palm, right? So, here's where we have some issues though. You have guys that do one of these numbers, right? Oh, sweet, I got it lined up. Problem with that is it's a little close to your face. You're not really taking advantage. You have the guys that are operating, right? They're all the way out here, their tactical turtle, their head is tucking down into their shoulders. We're putting unnecessary stress on our neck and our shoulders. We don't need that, okay? So, when we're presenting the gun, we don't wanna just be flat like this though, okay? Because if I'm soft in the wrist, the gun's gonna snap like this, okay? If I'm firm in the wrist, okay, the gun's gonna break the next uh, breaking point, which is my elbows, right? So they're gonna crack like this. So, you'll see guys just go like this, they flare, flare their elbows up, which is not necessarily wrong, but it's not necessarily right. The best way to get to this is, right, I'm already in my position. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate my wrist up and inward a little bit. Because of that, my elbows naturally flare, okay? So what that looks like here is instead of me just going like this, right, I'm here with the gun, and I'm here, okay? So what's happening is we're taking the pressure of our hands and we're clamming it in, right? You don't walk around like this with your hands. You don't walk around, well, you might walk around with your hands like this, but normally our hands are like this, right? So because of that, we're just taking that pressure and we're just canceling it in a little bit. We're kind of clamming up onto the top of the frame right below the barrel, so that way we're applying more pressure right below the axis. So because of that, our elbows naturally lift, and so now we're using our arms like the shocks of a car, where when we fire, it's bouncing, okay? Just bouncing and settled. Versus us getting a lot of that, you know, muzzle flip like this, or getting a lot of recoil like this, right? So we're kind of controlling all those things that are happening right in front of us. Let's go ahead and talk about dominance real quick in terms of our eyes. Typically, there are three categories. There is uh, sensory dominance, motor dominance, and uh, sighting dominance, right? And so I'm gonna show you guys sighting dominance, okay? This is for tracking our targets, right? Uh, it's the same concept that we were talking about using our thumbs, like pointed things or index fingers. Well, when we talk about this, there's a couple ways you can do these tests. You'll always see people do one of these where they're like, oh, just put your hands out like this, make a little circle, put it over the target, bring it back to your face, and you see guys go like this, and guess what? Where is it? It's right in the center, because they all cheat, okay? eliminate this, let's just, let's just make it faster. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and put my hands over the target, right? So I'm gonna put my hands over the target, which is the camera. At this point, I'm gonna keep both eyes open and without moving my head, I'm gonna go ahead and close my left eye. I still see the camera. I open my left eye, I still see the camera. I close my right eye, the camera is now gone. Guess what, I'm right eye dominant, okay? Another way you can do this too is you can take both hands, you can clasp them together, 
and I can use my index finger to point at something, and then I can wince my eyes back and forth. So like closing my left eye, it's still there. Closing my right eye, it's gone, okay? The other one is obviously the thumb test. You can do this with a friend, this is an easy one. Just put your thumb on their nose, and then you have them kind of, you do your own eye test too, where you close your eyes, but they should be able to see which eye that your thumb aligns with on your body, okay? So that's kind of a cool little tip. Um, when we're talking about this though, typically 60 to 70 percent, I think it's more on, on the 60 side of, 60 side of things, 60 percent of the population is same-sided uh, dominant. So they're like right hand, right eye, or they're left eye, left hand. There's that 40 percent or around that ish, right? That's right eye and left-handed or left, left eye and right-handed. And then there's a small percentage in the middle that does not have a preference on eye dominance. Like there is no allegiance to which eye, okay? So um, you'll hear people talk about, well, you know, it's so hard for me to shoot left eye with my right hand. Well, it probably is when you're on a rifle, right? Um, when we're using a handgun, because we're able to push this away and because the actual sight radius is so much shorter, you should be able to slightly cock your head or slightly tilt the gun or whatever it might be to kind of align yourself to those sights. When we're using a rifle though, because our rifle ha typically will have a sight right here in front of our face and one all the way out here, it's very hard, right? So naturally your left eye wants to take over if you're left eye dominant, but the rifle's on my right side. So typically my recommendation for that is switch to your weak side, shoot with your weak hand. It is easy to train your weak side, even though yes, it's not your hand that you open doors with, it's not the hand you, you know, uh, write with or whatever it might be. It's very easy to train yourself on your weak side, especially if you don't have any bad habits, right? You're not retraining it. You're giving it fresh training, okay? So once we've established our eye dominance, let's go ahead and talk about the focal plane, okay? Typically when we're aligning our sights, we have a rear sight and we have a front sight, okay? You'll see guys try to go to the range. They don't have sights on their guns. And you're like, that's cool, I guess. I mean, you can't really aim that thing. Oh, I'll be fine. So look at your rear sight. You then need to look through the gap and find your front sight, okay? Once you do that, you then have to align it to your target, okay? So if any of you guys play chess, or if you guys are familiar with like the shape of a castle, think of it that way. You have these two peaks in the back, right? And they come down, and there's a gap in the middle. That front side should be dead even in the center, so the term is equal light, equal height. It should be even across the top, equal spacing on the sides. Once you do this, you need to align it to your target. Depending on the type of sights you have, you might have what's called a sub six hold, a six o'clock hold, a center hold, or a 12 o'clock hold, right? 12 o'clock hold is when the front sight is touching the top of the target. A center hold is when the top blade of that front uh, sight is actually cutting right to the center of the target. So a great example is if I have the letter X, I should want to see the letter V sticking out of the top, okay? A six o'clock hold is where we're cutting right at the bottom of the target, so they're touching. And then a sub six hold is where we have a thin white line between the two, or a thin gap between the actual bullseye of the target or whatever it may be, and the front blade, okay? So when we talk about accuracy and marksmanship, the last point of control is where, right? Where should we actually be looking? Um, this is always up for debate because there are different types of shooting. Um, and, you know, I've had plenty of conversations about this, but when we're talking marksmanship, we're talking about actual accuracy. We need to look through the rear, find the front, find the target, come back to the front sight, and we fire. The reason we fire here is because this is our last point of control, right? It's kind of like when you squeeze toothpaste out of a tube, right? You squeeze it out, you can't just shove it back in there, okay? Well, with a gun, when you fire, you can't just, oh, curve the bullet. It's not the move you wanted, right? So the front sight is our last point of control, and that's why it's so important that you focus on that. Uh, there are other things called like a stress sight picture or intuitive sight picture or a hard subject sight, uh, sight picture where we're focusing on the target. We're focusing on the threat that just came through our door in the middle of the night or whatever it may be. That's a different discussion. Um, but what's happening is we have what's called a focal plane, okay? If you need to take your dominant hand, put it in front of your face, go ahead and look at it, okay? Put your weak hand off in the distance behind it. Keep looking at your dominant hand though. You notice that this hand is in focus, this hand is out of focus. If I bring this hand up, okay, this hand is now in focus even though I'm not focusing on it. I'm still looking at this hand, okay? Let's go ahead and put that back down there. So the same concept, I could look at my left hand. This hand is in focus, this is out of focus. If I push it down, now they're both in focus, okay? So with iron sights, we have three focal planes. We are trying to compress them. It is very difficult. You're focusing on your first focal, or you're focusing on your front sight focal plane. Uh, that's why you'll see a lot of guys use red dot. Uh, the reason being with a red dot, you are compressing all the focal planes. It's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, for the longest time, guys are like, oh, why would I use a red dot on a rifle? Well, it's the same concept with handguns today. A lot of guys are like, oh, why would I ever use a red dot on a pistol? You'd be surprised. If you put in the time to shoot with a red dot on a pistol, uh, there are plenty of instructors out there you can take classes with, like uh, Scott Jadlinski or Jedi, um, Last Samurai Project. There's a lot of guys like that that teach specific courses on red dot training. Uh, what's happening though is you're compressing all three focal planes, 
you're taking it where all of a sudden I'm looking at my target, I'm superimposing the dot on it, and then I can fire, right? So it's a little bit faster, especially if you train with it. All right, guys, so let's wrap it up. Uh, I know it's kind of brief, and I know I probably made it longer than I meant to, but I hope you guys learned something about the order of operations. I hope you guys learned something a little bit more about your grip and understanding it, as well as understanding our focal uh, planes and our eye dominance. Um, there's really a lot of cool concepts out there if you do some research. Um, I know there's a lot of new shooters out there. There's a lot of new buyers out there. Um, so please be safe. You know, if you're watching this video for the first time and you're new to guns, make sure you ask a friend for some advice and you, you know, find an instructor out there that you can actually go see and that can help guide you through your process of learning to shoot. Um, I think it's great when you are taught properly from the start versus kind of fumbling your way through it and then realizing like, oh, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. Um, because I'm, you know, the first time I was actually taught, ding, light bulb went off. Because for me, it was like, here's a gun, press the trigger. Okay, great. Uh, that was outside of scouts, my bad. Um, so it's one of those things where if there's an opportunity there, definitely take advantage of it. For all of you guys that are watching that are shooters already, you know, if there are new friends of yours or friends of yours that are getting into firearms at this time, uh, you know, share your knowledge with them. Help make them a safer uh, gun owner, right? So everyone that's staying at home, please be safe. Everyone that's still out and working, make sure you're washing your hands and please be safe. Um, you guys are definitely helping uh, keep the economy going. I know, I definitely know that times are hard for everyone right now. Um, it's very sad to see some of these small businesses closing. Um, so try to remember to support your local business. All right, guys, as always, I'm Ryan with Manus Defense. Stay safe, shoot straight. Yeah.